Good evening all, and welcome. Happy New Year, from me and my family, to you and yours. I hope you start your year off the right way, and have great times ahead of you. However, as one year ends and another begins, it doesn't always necessarily lead to happy times, as we're about to find out. So I hope you're ready, because it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. It's New Year's Eve, and after a wild night of kisses and body shots, I'm outright dead. I crawled into my buddy's bed alone at about 2am, and had the greatest 20 minute sleep of my life. I wake up to the sound of a constant thumping and cracking noise, Every other second I hear a thump, then silence. I slowly get out of his bed and creep across the bedroom. The plan was that only him and I would be staying over, and although I found a few various people nestled on couches, the bathtub, or just motionless on the floor, nothing was out of place. I couldn't find the source of the constant drumming, until I was in his basement at ground level, and facing the corner of the room. My hand touched the wall's corner, still hearing constant thumping from the other side. It was coming from the inside of the wall. I stood back maybe a few inches and just stared. That's when the tip of an axe breaks clean through the wall. I screamed out and heard my friend rushing down the stairs. I'm frozen in panic against the opposite wall, when he blew through the door. He sees the axe wiggling back through the wall, then crashing again through it, sending splinters across the floor. He grabs a shovel, and we fly out the back door, turning the corner of the house to confront the axe-wielding psycho. What we found was an axe stuck firmly into the side of the house, with nobody around, we did a few laps of his house, and found no traces of the mysterious midnight lumberjack. Freakiest thing I've ever experienced. The axe lodged in the side of the house, now sits in his basement, in a closed footlocker, waiting for its owner to come back and claim it. It was New Year's Eve and myself and two of my friends were out the front of my house listening to music on my iPod. We were about 12 at the time, and there was no one else around. It was probably 10.30 at night, and we were waiting for the illegal fireworks to light up down the street, as this happened every year. It probably sounds a little weird, 12 year old kids alone at 10.30 pm listening to Katy Perry in the middle of the street, but it wasn't too unusual. See, my neighborhood is very close, we know the neighbors really well, so our parents, who were in the house, and ourselves, weren't all that concerned. We were listening to Hot and Cold by Katy Perry, and we were jamming along to it when we began to hear a whistle. First off, it sounded like it was part of the song, so I initially ignored it, but that was until it started to distort and go out of the rhythm. It didn't seem to be in tune with the song, and it was eerily out of pitch. I don't know why, maybe to hear it better, but my friend decided to pause the music. As soon as the music stopped, the whistling persisted, pitchy and slow. We were a little bit spooked, it was dark outside, other than the few street lights on the road, we couldn't really see much or make much out of the darkness, other than the strange whistling. We were able to pinpoint the direction it was coming from soon enough though. We turned towards it and froze, about 10 meters from where we stood, just on the edge of the street lamp's light, was a man. He looked disheveled, likely homeless, and was standing there looking at us, whistling that pitchy whistle. We were all frozen for a while, and caught off guard, until my fight or flight kicked in. I yelled at my friends to get inside, 
and they began to scream and run up the driveway. I pushed and shoved them forward, terrified because I didn't know whether they could hear what I was hearing. But the whistling had finally stopped, but something else was drowning out the silence. Heavy footsteps settled. He was chasing after us. I screamed bloody murder, opened the front door, and shoving them inside, not caring if I hurt them, I turned to slam the deadbolt on as he reached the screen door. I watched his figure come into view. He was dirty, wearing soiled long sleeved clothes and had an unkept beard and wore a torn beanie. As I closed the door, he stopped just ahead of the screen looked at me dead in the eyes and murmured something that still makes my skin crawl. Damn it. One of my friends consoled the other, who was now in tears, and I watched him through the peephole. He lingered for a second more, then disappeared into the blackness. I remember my friend grabbing me and asking me if I was okay, and then pointed down to my hands. I was shaking like a leaf. We never told our parents. My close girlfriends and I went for a few days to my country home during a New Year's. We were 17, five in total, and the house is 125 years old and is located on the main road of a small town. The backyard is huge. The way to enter the lot is through three front doors, one hard to climb front gate, the gate of an old not in use wine house that belongs to my grandfather, and is connected by another gate to my backyard, and the neighbor's backyard that used to belong to the cousin of the family. For someone who spends her weekends in that home, it isn't creepy at all. I am kind of scared of the backyard, but mostly of the idea of seeing some animal like a mouse or cat or something. My friends felt the unease of being in an old, big country house new to them. So back to the story. My friends and I were in the kitchen preparing dinner or some drinks. I can't remember. So it was already dark. We had music on. We're dancing, having fun. Typical horror movie serial killer target stuff. Then suddenly, we hear a loud bang on the kitchen's wooden window covers. We freak the hell out, turn down the music and just froze looking at each other. The noise came back, followed by a deep manly voice shouting, Hey. Not creepy, but threatening old man from the countryside kind of scary. I did not recognize the voice. They all look at me in panic, trying to figure out if I knew what the hell was happening. The living room window covers were open, but we were all too scared to look outside to the backyard. So we decided to close them for protection. Having the voice materialized into a visual threat felt way worse than just leaving it to a hopeful fade. In my mind, in a few seconds, I was trying to think of every non creepy scenario where what was happening would be logical. Nothing came to me. My only thought was how the hell could anyone have opened a four meter metal gate to the wine house and get access to the backyard? And why shout and bang on the windows without saying anything else? That had never happened here. I remember that there were some drug addicts that broke into the wine house trying to find stuff to sell when I was barely a baby. So it could have been something like that. We were all freaking out. They asked me if I knew what was going on, and I couldn't give anything back. I was the host, so I had to do something. I ran to a cabinet where my father stored his hunting shotgun, which I'd never used, and an air pressure gun that uses little lead ammo. I had pretty good training with the second one, so I take that. Although it couldn't kill anyone, shooting the balls or penis would be enough to stop somebody enabling us to overpower them. This is Portugal. So not many people have guns and you need a license renovated frequently. And that made me assume that he probably wasn't armed. I was terrified, but adrenaline gave me a helping push. And I started shouting, 
Who's out there? No one answered. I peeked through the living room windows and saw no one. Only the right side of the backyard was visible, not the back itself that leads to the wine house exit. And I decided it was better to not go outside and wait a bit to see if the creepy man had left. We waited all scared, trying to make sense of what had happened. We didn't even think of calling the police. And after a while, we were back to fun and music, even did a little bonfire in the backyard and tried not to think about it anymore. To this day, I haven't asked my parents who that could have been and why, and still find no possible and reasonable explanation for the deep, hoarse, threatening voice that belonged to no one. This happened on New Year's Eve 2010, turning into 2011. My dad's sister and I were at my uncle's New Year's Eve party. I was 17 at the time, my sister 15. And between me, my sister, our two cousins, and aunt's relatives kids, there were about 10 teenagers at this party. Some important background. At the time, we lived in a rural area in central Florida. And while the area for the most part was a nice place to live, there can be no denying that it is deep south, and some areas are still more bound to be the old ways of the south than others. It's also important to know, it's just how deep the bond between my sister and I is. Like I said, I was 17, she was 15. And she was and still is my absolute best friend. Just about everything I did and do I did with her, and vice versa. We had all the same interests, friends groups, and what we didn't have in common, we still loved to share and try and introduce each other to. By every definition, we are inseparable. So here we are, a group of rowdy, loud-mouthed teenagers at a party. It's only about 9pm, and we were all restless in need of something to do. One of us brought up the local cemetery that was a five minute drive from my uncle's house that was reputed amongst locals to be very haunted. Its oldest graves dated back to the late 1700s to early 1800s. It wasn't just the age that gives this cemetery its reputation, but rather its history. It was also the site of several lynchings of innocent black people by white supremacists. It was also where a woman was stoned to death for adultery and or witchcraft, again in the late 1700s to early 1800s. Naturally, we convinced my dad and uncle to take us. So we all piled into the back of my uncle's huge truck. We girls in the cabin with dad and uncle and the boys in the back, and set off for some spooky exploration. To get to this cemetery, you must drive about a mile's worth of dirt road through virgin land. So a mile in the dark on a road completely canopied by enormous live oaks and palms. Forestry so thick, you can't see more than 15 to 20 feet in front of you. So it was already an unnerving atmosphere before we even arrived to the cemetery properly. Before we entered, the dirt road curved to the left, and on the outer part of the curve was a row of juniper trees that were around 20 to 25 feet tall. When that grove came into view, I suddenly saw a face peering straight at us from above those trees. It was the face of a young man, and when I say I saw a face, I don't mean I caught a brief glimpse of some transparent could be face. This guy looked flesh and blood and alive. I can even remember distinctly what he looked like. Medium skin tone for a black person, a broad flat nose, shortish curled hair, and green eyes that reflected in the headlights like a cat's eyes, and a completely blank, emotionless expression. I stared at him for a solid five seconds or so, before he just vanished. 
I sat there stunned, wondering if I should even say anything. But then, one of the other girls started to freak out. Did you see that? Did you see that man? She screamed. Keep in mind, those juniper trees were at least 20 feet tall, and there were no other trees or growths near them for another 30 feet or so. There was nothing he could have been standing on, not to mention the way the face just blinked out of existence. Still, we stopped, and one of the men looked behind the junipers out of curiosity. They found absolutely nothing, and no one. Equally strange, is even though he was dead ahead of us and very visible, only that one other girl and I saw him at the exact same time, and no one else did. In the cemetery itself, a few other less pronounced things happened. But they boiled down to me and a few others in the group, feeling a very negative presence. We left after about five minutes, when we returned to my uncle's house. I noticed that my sister seemed off. She's usually more reserved, but now she's dead silent, and very quick to anger, which was an unusual trait for her. Our uncle tried to lighten the mood by pranking us and throwing a firecracker into the garage. My sister, who is normally a fan of pranks, on top of being quiet, just looks over on him and shouts at him. Keep in mind she was 15 and still hesitant to be rude to her elders, southern upbringing and that, and it was kind of a dick move on my uncle's part, but certainly not worthy of an outburst, and it was very out of character. After a while, the conversation veered off and changed into a subject I had no interest in, so I got up to look at the firework. My sister got up and followed me, and as I said, we're inseparable. I walked out of the garage with my sister right behind me, and to the side. I didn't pay her much attention as I was enjoying the fireworks, and a particularly big one went off, and I made some comment, and she didn't respond. So I turned to look at her and repeat to myself, only she wasn't there. She was still sitting in the garage with the group, and this creepy zoned out thousand yard stare is plastered on her face. I'm telling you, I saw someone standing behind me. She was standing to the side and not completely behind me, but I saw her right at my shoulder, constantly in my peripheral sight. As soon as I turned to look directly at her, she vanished, or was never there to begin with, as she was in the garage. As the night dragged on, she got stranger and stranger. Her pupils were fully dilated, even when we brought her into a brightly lit room. Worse still, she complained of severe neck pain, and a rash began to form around her neck. A rash that was in the exact pattern of a rope burn on a hanging victim. The rash spread to no other parts of her body. Our dad had to rub on some antihistamine cream, and I looked it over, but it wasn't inflamed, swollen, or itchy. It was just there, more like a birthmark than a true rash. She spoke like she was drugged, very spaced out, not wanting anything except water. She kept complaining that her neck hurt. When we were freaking out over her pupils, she would just be like, oh, weird, and go for more water. By this point, we'd had enough, and got some of my aunt's things and my cousin, who had dabbled in all religions and is very spiritual, prayed over my sister, begged her to toughen up and give whatever was doing this the boot. Just a few minutes before midnight, her usual personality returned, and the flash faded as spontaneously as it appeared. The pupil stayed somewhat dilated for a while longer, and she complained of headaches, but otherwise she was fine. Whatever. At least it passed. We've discussed that night several times since then, but only recently did we discover a detail that made both of our blood run cold. Though neither of us can remember the exact time clearly, my sister swears she remembers going out to the car 
around the time we were in the garage, talking to the other teens. Somehow she mistakenly thought we were going to be leaving then. And she says she does not remember how long she waited in the car, but it was a while. A few minutes before midnight, she realized the New Year's Eve ball was about to drop and we were staying for it. And then she returned inside only because she was never in the car. I kept her with me the entire time. I was genuinely freaked out because even if it had nothing to do with that cemetery, I was genuinely concerned there may have been something medical going on and was trying to figure out what it could have been. When I told my sister this, I don't think I've ever seen a look more terrified on her face. She genuinely only remembers just sitting in the car wondering where everyone else was. She passed out and was okay. This past New Year's Eve, I went away for the night with my two best friends and one of their mums. I was home for the holidays from college. And my friend Sarah invited me to go to Palm Springs to celebrate New Year's with her mum and our friend Rachel. I didn't have any other plans. So I decided to go with them. We went to a cool city about an hour from where we live. That is big on shopping and resorts. We plan to have a pretty calm night, watch the ball drop at a block party thing downtown and have a few drinks at a bar. Since we're on the West Coast, the ball drop is at nine. So around eight, we ventured from our hotel, walked to the block party about a mile away. And on the way we passed a very lively bar. We decided to stop by and spent 15 minutes dancing, but didn't get any drinks. It was a gay bar. And Sarah and Rachel being gay, was stoked on it and wanted to come back after the ball dropped, even though it was about 90% men there. We continue on to the block party, get some dinner, a glass of champagne, and the ball dropped, and they had a DJ. So we spent about an hour in there dancing. After we got tired of it, we opted to head back to the bar and hang out there until midnight. Once we get there, Sarah's mum pays for a drink for each of us, but leaves soon after that as she was tired. It being 1030 at this point, and Sarah and Rachel and I are enjoying our drinks and having fun. Rachel tried some of my drink since it was one she hadn't tried before. I constantly have my guard up when drinking in public. And I felt safe at this bar because it was 90% gay men who I thought would have no interest in me. I went back to the bar to get a second drink. And that's the last thing I remember. The rest I've gathered from Sarah and Rachel. Almost immediately after getting my second drink, I asked Rachel to go to the bathroom with me because I wasn't feeling well, even though I was feeling fine not 10 minutes previously. Once in the bathroom, I just collapsed on the floor and I was almost unresponsive. Rachel now worried somehow drags my half lifeless body out to where Sarah was waiting for us. Security seeing my condition and assuming I was wasted asked us to leave. Sarah and Rachel decide to take me back to the hotel about half a mile away. By this point, I was unconscious and there were barely sounds escaping from my mouth. They saw someone leave the bar at the same time as us who was walking nearby. But they were preoccupied with trying to keep my lifeless body from the ground. And at one point, I threw up all over myself, both of them and the sidewalk. The next part of the story we had to get from Sarah and Rachel doesn't have any memory of this part. Still struggling to carry me, the man they saw leave the bar approached them. He was hitting on Rachel, trying to get her to grab a drink with him. She was very agitated and told him to leave. Her friend needed help right now, and he didn't take no for an answer and continued to follow us down the street, 
asking if they wanted to get drinks with him, if he can help carry me and such. A middle-aged woman witnessing this came up and told the man off, something along the lines of, stop harassing these young women, or I'm going to call the police. And he left. Next, by some miracle, an EMT and his wife enjoying the holidays ran into us on the street. He checked me out to make sure something wasn't majorly wrong, and then carried me the rest of the way to my hotel and into the room, since my friends could barely hold me up. They thanked him profusely, and him and his wife left. And this is where Rachel's memory kicks back in. Five minutes later, they get a knock on the door, and it's the EMT and his wife. They came to let us know that a man followed us into the hotel, and they just saw him hop the gate and start to make his way to our room. My friends called hotel security, but they were unable to locate him. My friends didn't get a glimpse of him, but I'm sure it was the same man from earlier. I spent the rest of the night vomiting everything in my body and dry heaving after that. I woke up next morning in a pile of pillows and blankets on the bathroom floor. My last memory was at the bar getting a second drink, and my friends filled me in on everything that happened. Feeling like crap, I thought I must have drunk way too much but I'd never blacked out before in my life. And the amount of drink I had didn't add up to me being completely unconscious. We decided my first drink had to have been drugged since Rachel had some of it and had no memory of our walk home, even though she was fully functional. I'm sure that man that was talking to Rachel and then followed us back was the one that slipped something into my drink. To this day, I don't really know how I could have been slipped something. I got my drink from the bar and never set it down. My best guess was that it was already in the cup. Thankfully, I had good friends and kind strangers protecting me that night. It keeps me up at night thinking what could have happened under different circumstances. This happened on New Year's Eve 2004. I was a good kid. I didn't drink until I was legally old enough. So what happened can't be put down to alcohol. I had been to a New Year's Eve party at a friend's house while her parents were out. When her parents returned, we left them to it and moved the party to another friend's house. Around 5am I decided to call it a night and make my way back home. I walked for 20 minutes before getting to the stage where I had to walk under a motorway. Just to let you know, you cross the bridge and you're under the motorway. So it's essentially an open tunnel with lots of thick pillars. It goes on for quite a while as there are three roads that it crosses underneath. The first is right at the start. The second 200 meters up and the final one 300 meters beyond that point. The final one is right at the end where I come out and walk up my street. Just behind the final road is a street light and a working men's club. Now, I had seen a few people scattered about. So when I came to cross to the second road and saw a figure up ahead under the street light, I didn't bat an eyelid, especially with the working men's club behind it. As I got closer, I realized the figure was a girl wearing a fancy dress. She has a costume that would have fitted somewhere between 1900s to 1920s. It was a light color, but our street lights are orange. So everything was disguised by the orange glow. And I couldn't say for certain what color it was. She was standing looking to her right up the road into what could have been oncoming traffic. I remember thinking that she was wearing odd clothes for this time of year, but each to their own. And I stared at her right until I was standing directly opposite. The other side of the final road, I looked left and looked right and crossed the road. And by the time I reached the other side, the girl was gone. No cars had passed. There was nothing behind that she could have gone to without me seeing and I looked away from her for about two seconds. 
What happened to that girl? This all happened Tuesday night. My significant other Kyle and I went to an absolutely fantastic concert for New Year's Eve. We met up with a few friends, but they all left right after midnight. The bands were great. So we wanted to stay for the rest of the show. Kyle got a call from a good friend, Nathan, at around 1am. Nathan said that he was at the same bar and wanted to know if we were still there. We were stoked because Nathan never gets out the house. He's a super cool guy and we love hanging out with him. And he had a girlfriend with him who I like a lot. And his friend, Derek. I don't like Derek at all. Derek just gives off a creepy vibe. He talks slow and monotone and he stares for too long and leans in too close. He is Nathan's pity friend. They were best friends for a long time and Derek's family did a lot for Nathan during a rough patch. Nathan will bring him along every now and again because he feels obligated to at this point, but he has no trust in him whatsoever. Derek is a drug addict. Anyway, we all hang out and have some laughs. Derek sits there being all freaky as usual, just staring at everyone. When he would speak, it would be something off the wall and completely unrelated to anything anyone was talking about. Once he looked at Dawn and I and said, I think it'd be really weird if you two made out. Okay, yeah, it would be weird. We ignored that and kept on having fun. The bar closed and Kyle asked them if they wanted to come to our house and have some more drinks and play foosball and Tekken. I was a little annoyed because he didn't okay this with me first and I was ready for bed. I wasn't that upset though. I know that Kyle just likes to have company and I told him I wouldn't mind if it was just Nathan and Dawn as I didn't want Derek in our house and I don't trust him. Kyle brushed it off and says, what's the worst that can happen? It'll be fine, he's just weird. Well, when we're all leaving, we had to wait for Derek in the parking lot for the longest time. Turns out he was waiting outside the door of the bar and trying to get any girl to come with him, bribing them with free pills. I got mad and said, what makes you think it's okay to invite random people into my house? He just laughed. We get to my house and he sits on the couch by me. He keeps poking me. And when I ask him what he wants, he stares for 10 seconds before saying, what's up? I started ignoring him. He continued to poke me and tickle my feet and I wouldn't even look over. Then he starts getting phone calls from people asking for pills. I went to the bathroom and he tried to follow me in there. I pushed him out, locked the door and he knocked. After this, he starts trying to get Nathan and Dawn to take him home, which was 45 minutes away and it's 4 a.m. They tell him no way. They had agreed he was staying with them and they actually wanted to go to their house and sleep in their own bed 10 minutes away. He didn't want to go to their house. He wanted to go home or stay at our place. He started whining and telling me that I had to convince them to stay. I told him no. So he began saying Dawn had too much to drink to drive. The girl had one beer the entire night. When they were getting ready to leave, Derek comes back in and says he needs to use the restroom. Kyle is overly trusting of people and doesn't pay attention to the weird behavior, but I'm the opposite. So I keep an eye on dodgy Derek. I caught him going through my prescription bottles. They were nothing but antibiotics, but it pissed me off that he was trying to steal from us. And I told him he needed to leave immediately. He then stood in our kitchen, refusing to leave, staring at us. And I said that they were waiting on him and that he needed to go now. Don't you remember the time I gave you guys a ride? Well, make it even. You either convince them to stay or I'll stay here and y'all take me home. No way. 
He gave us a ride home when we had a flat once, and we lived two blocks apart at the time. We weren't going 45 minutes away to take a weirdo home that's refusing to leave for unknown reasons. He kept saying that Dawn was drunk, and Kyle speaks up and says, If you get in the roadblock, I'll come to get you. And he says, Well, are you gonna post the bail too? Because we're your responsibility now. I'm beyond frustrated at this point, and told Kyle, You invited them, now get rid of him. And I went to sit on the couch. Derek continued to stand there and stare at Kyle. Kyle, normally passive, is getting angry and telling him it's time for him to go and that we aren't taking him home or convincing anyone to stay. Derek says that he's not leaving, so he has to do one or the other. Kyle finally went outside and got Nathan to come, literally drag Derek to the car. And the next morning, Nathan called and asked if we were missing an iPhone, because Derek mysteriously has one now. Yes, in fact, my old iPhone was missing from the drawer. It was off, and I'd rather just let Derek keep it than communicate with him further. Nathan has apologized profusely and says that he isn't bringing Derek around anymore. When I was around 12, I spent New Year's Eve at my friend's house whilst our parents were out to a restaurant in a nearby town. The house was old and pretty isolated, and to be honest, it scared the crap out of me. You had to drive up a long, overgrown track to reach it. A lot of my other friends at school would say the house was haunted, and it was actually featured in a ghost book if I remember rightly. So anyway, we were sat downstairs in the lounge watching some TV, and heard the loudest crashing sound. I still remember the look in my friend's eyes when we turned to each other in shock. It took us a while to get up, and actually go investigate where the sound was coming from, and what it was. We crept out the lounge down the hallway to the rest of the house. The crashing sounded like it came from upstairs, so we headed up to check it out. When we got to the top of the stairs, there was a breeze coming from somewhere. It was ice cold. We moved down the hallway upstairs towards the wind, and turned to go down another corridor. Bear in mind this house was massive, and honestly, it was near enough a mansion from the 1920s. At the end of the corridor was his parents' bedroom. The door was moving back and forth slowly. We both stopped, and just stood still frozen, and not saying a word to each other. After a moment, my friend walked towards the door. I was still frozen in fear, and fell behind a little. As he pushed the door open and snuck into the room, the darkness consumed him. I could barely make out his silhouette. There was perfect silence for a few seconds before I heard him let out the most terrifying scream. My adrenaline kicked in, and I ran towards the room to see what had happened. I searched for the light and turned it on. He was stood frozen stiff and pale, just staring into an empty corner of the room. Just to the side of him, was a massive antique mirror that was smashed into pieces, with shards of glass scattered all over the floor. I placed my arm on his shoulder, and asked him if he was okay. She broke the mirror. Who? The woman in the corner. She told me to. At that point, I was honestly like, screw this and told him we should leave. He turned to leave with me, and just before we did, I wanted to check the mirror. Surely the wire had broken or something. I bent down to inspect, turned it over, and the string that was still holding it to the wall was intact. It hadn't snapped. I looked at the wall. The nail was also still firmly fixed to the wall. 
At that point, I was so terrified. I told him to call his parents and tell them to come home. We waited outside the front door until our parents arrived from the restaurant. My dad and his went straight up to the bedroom to check it out. When they arrived, they saw the broken mirror. They sort of pushed it off and said we were up to no good and playing a game that got out of hand. And after that night, my friend never really spoke about it to me. The worst part is that I'm 24 now and was having a general chat with my mum as New Year's is coming up soon. That night came up. I told her about it and she said, I believe you. Your friend's mum told me a few days after that night that she had seen a woman in her room telling her to leave the house. It honestly sent my whole body tingling and I had flashbacks to that night. It's honestly sent my whole body tingling and I had flashbacks to that night, with it being 12 years ago now. To this day, I still can't work out how the mirror fell off the wall. It would have had to have been physically lifted up and over the hook. I think it's best if I just forget it. I don't like trying to picture the woman my friend kept saying he saw. When I was 13, the dawning of a new millennium took place on New Year's Eve. While people were fearing the worst with the Y2K bug, or out partying and drinking, I was home alone. In 1996, my parents had split up. And from there they divorced, and my mother and I moved across the country from Oregon to Tennessee, with her best friend. On the eve of the year 2000, I was home alone, and my mother was currently out of state. Now this didn't worry me, as this was not the first time. I often came home to find a note on the kitchen counter, saying that she had gone to Florida for a few days, and that there were some groceries in the fridge. Since the divorce, she was regularly leaving me alone for long periods of time to go to Florida. We lived on a relatively quiet road, surrounded by trees, and set a few miles out of town. And I know most of the people, if not by name, then by face, well enough to wave and have small chats with, and have never been given a reason to be afraid of being alone. On the night in question, I was staying up late watching television. I remember that I was watching the movie his bodyguard on USA channel, and had most of the lights on in the house. Not because I was afraid, but because at 13, I wasn't concerned with electricity bills or saving the environment. I felt completely safe and protected within the confines of my bubble of home. As I was watching the movie, I kept hearing these weird sounds outside. But I remember thinking it was likely just the neighbours. Though they weren't extremely close, a couple of them were having a party, and about halfway into the movie, the power in the house suddenly went dead. I sat on the couch for a minute, just sort of in a panic daze because it was near midnight, and pitch black. I remember thinking the power must have gone out, and that it would come back on in a while. So I decided to sit on the couch with my blanket and wait. A few minutes passed by when I heard a noise in the kitchen, where the back door is. My heart started racing in my chest, because I thought it sounded like the back door being shut. The back door sits just off the dining room, which is connected to the kitchen, which leads directly into the living room, where I was currently sitting on the couch. A few seconds passed after I heard the sound, and I was straining my ears to pick up anything that wasn't supposed to be there. Every noise suddenly felt magnified. When footsteps sounded, I immediately slithered off the couch onto all fours and crawled around the ottoman, and started, as slowly and as quietly as I could, to make my way towards the space between the love seat and the couch. 
I knew I could fit under the side table and be completely hidden by the dark and the ottoman. From playing hide and seek in the dark many, many times with my friends during sleepovers, I knew this was a good hiding spot. I was nearly there when the footsteps became more pronounced. I knew from the sound of them that whoever it was was making their way through the kitchen now towards the living room. They weren't hurried or anything. It was like they were just moving around in the kitchen. I glanced up from where I was crouched on the floor. And to my horror, there was a dark silhouette standing in the archway between the two doors. To my credit, I didn't scream. However, I did panic. I stood immediately to my feet from my hiding spot and ran down the hallway. And I believe the only reason I wasn't overcome was because the person chasing me had to get around the Ottoman in the dark to follow me. I did what all children do when they're afraid. And I bypassed the front door, the guest bedroom, the bathroom, and ran to the farthest door down the hallway, my room. In all honesty, I probably wouldn't have been able to get to the front door, unlock it and open it in time, as it was right off the side of the couch. When I was 10, I got a bird for my birthday. He was a blue fronted Amazon and I called him Boo because it was October and close to Halloween. Boo had a large iron cage. It could have been metal, but it was very large and sturdy, at least six feet tall, and that it was always kept in my room. Despite the fact that Boo, like me, pretty much had run of the house whenever he wanted, this information will become relevant later. As I run into the room, I slammed the door shut and locked it. However, the lock was simply one of those little turn knobs that you could easily pop with a coin or butter knife. I had barely gotten the door shut and locked when the person on the other side knocked on it. I have no idea why they knocked, if they did it to mock me or scare me, but I knew in my heart that my little lock was not going to keep whoever it was on the other side out of my room. It didn't keep my mother out when we were arguing, and it wouldn't stand up to brute force. I was panicking on the verge of tears when the person began to laugh. It was a low, quiet laugh, which made it even more frightening. It wasn't like manic laughter, but as if they were genuinely amused. It was the laughter that really frightened me. And I started crying heavily and hysterically and looked around the room for anything I could do. That's when I realized Boo's cage would fit almost perfectly between the door and the wall of my closet. The cage moved quietly on my carpeted floor. But as I pushed it into place, it scraped against the door and alerted whoever was on the other side that I was attempting to barricade myself in because suddenly they threw themselves at my door and you could hear the sound of the wood splintering and the door handle being twisted violently. Boo, who had been stirred by the movements, awoke and literally began to scream and flap his wings. I might have screamed with him, but I don't remember doing so. And just remember this terrified and extreme fear overcome me. I crawled under my bed which is a bunk bed with a futon on the bottom. And several minutes passed and the person eventually stopped attacking my door. Boo continued screaming even after he had stopped. Though being under my bed, it gave me no feelings of being secure. I didn't come out from under it because I had nowhere else to go. I thought about trying to go to the window, but I was too afraid he might be there expecting me on the other side. Not to mention it was also several feet until I hit the ground, as the house was built on a raised foundation. I remember laying under my bed terrified for hours. I must have fallen asleep because I woke up the next day at daylight. 
The fear of what happened came back to me as soon as I registered where I was and why, and scared that whoever has been in my house might still be there. I decided to crawl out the window and run to a neighbor's since it was daylight outside, and therefore I felt less afraid. Crawling out is a lot harder than it looks. Once I was back on my feet, however, I carefully made my way around the house, and that's when I noticed the back door was wide open. Scared but feeling braver than I was, as I was now outside, and it was not pitch black, I walked up the back steps and peered inside. Seeing nothing out of the ordinary, I decided to go in. Looking back, I cringe on how stupid this must have turned out, and that I wish I could have told my younger self to make the smarter move and grab help. But thankfully, no one was in the house. I did a terrifying heart pounding room to room check, looking in closets and under beds, behind the couch and anywhere. I thought even a small child might be able to fit. I even popped the locks on my mum's bedrooms so I could check it and then relocked it. And that's when I noticed that the breaker box on the opposite wall was open. The main switch had been pulled. I flipped it back on, locked both locks on the back door, checked all the windows and front doors and then called my mum, where I once again broke down crying hysterically. She called a co-worker who came and stayed the entire day with me as they drove back. My mum still takes random trips to Florida after that, but I always went with her from then going forward. So terrified laughing crazy person that broke into my house on New Year's Eve? Please, let's never meet again. Last year, my family and our friends reserved two houses for us to celebrate the New Year's Eve on. One house was for me and my parents, and the other one was for our friends. As we arrived and greeted each other, we sat around this big table and started talking and playing tabletop games. We were all in the first house at this point, and as you can imagine, I was pretty bored after a while, so I began playing on my phone. But my battery eventually started to drain, so I wanted to grab my charger from my room in the second house. I grabbed the keys, went to go outside, and opened the second door and put the key in the closest corner of the table. I intentionally put them there so that as I'm unpacking my stuff, I don't lose them somehow. You know how it goes with your keys or your phone. It's super easy to lose them and then they're nowhere to be found. Anyway, back to the story. I had to be careful since we only had one key per house. And after I left the key on the table, I went up to my room and grabbed the charger. It took me about two to three minutes. And as I went downstairs, the keys were gone. I instantly froze and shivers went down my spine. My hair stood up and tears were pushed into my eyes. I was freaked the hell out. Adrenaline flooded my body and I gained courage, clenched my fists and started screaming. All of this happened in a matter of seconds. I don't know if you get that feeling when you're scared and brave at the same time. I looked around and saw the keys were now on the kitchen counter four meters away from the spot I had put them on. I knew that it wasn't much that could happen. And I'm not the type that suffers short term memory loss. But in any case, I grabbed them and ran. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. If of course you did, let me know down below. Happy New Year again to each and every one of you. Thank you to everyone who comes and listens, because you guys make this channel what it is. And I love being able to produce content for all of you. Have some pretty good videos lined up for this year. It's gonna be fun. So especially January. January looks like we've got some really interesting topics. I'm probably going to put some out on polls. So yeah, keep an eye out, wait and see. It, it's going to be fun. 
As always, a huge thank you to my incredible patrons whose names can be seen on screen. If you'd like yours on screen, feel free to check our Patreon. For as little as a dollar a month, you can really help keep the channel going. And it of course means a lot to me. If there's a story of something that's happened to you that you would like to share, feel free to send it to my email or Reddit. All links can be found in the description. But in any case, it's now time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, stay safe, have a great new year, and I'll see you in the next one.